sorry, I had to step away for a few moments. So welcome back again. And uh, today we're gonna continue our study of theories of chemical bonding. And uh, there's a progression here in the things that we've discussed, right? We started out by proposing these Lewis structures. It's a way of just sketching out what the connections of the atoms are in a molecule. And then we added an extra layer, a theory called valence shell electron pair repulsion theory or VSEPR, where we predict based on the repulsion of the electron clouds of the atoms and uh, lone pairs around the central atom, what kind of shape our molecule is gonna have. What we haven't discussed yet is what is a chemical bond actually? What is happening when two atoms link up to form a chemical bond? And that is the subject of our discussion today. We'll see how far we can get. There's actually two different theories, uh, two competing theories. Each one explains a different aspect of chemical bonding uh, very well, and they are not capable of explaining other aspects. So it's an interesting situation where you have two different theories, each with its pluses and each with its minuses. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and go to our PowerPoint presentation today. Actually, before we do that, let me go over a few things here in our uh, Canvas page. Just wanna make sure that we all know what's going on here. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm trying to get this thing out of the way. There you go. A few things that you should be aware of. Uh, let me see, I have my list here because it's several things. Number one, assignments. Um, oh, hold on a second, please. Hold on, uh, looks like I have to... Uh, Okay, now we're gonna go to that uh, screen that I was trying to get to. And uh, we're also gonna see if we can get rid of these uh, different things here. Okay, so I was saying that if you go to your Canvas page, there's a few things that have been added. For example, there is an upcoming assignment here uh, doing Lewis structures. This is gonna be worth 10 points. It's a dry lab. So please download this worksheet, watch the video, and it'll tell you what to do. There's gonna be a second worksheet coming up this weekend, or maybe by tomorrow perhaps, and you'll be able to do that. And the two of them combined form what we normally call experiment L, which is L for Lewis. It's a totally dry lab activity. I, well, I'm, I am gonna post the answers to this so that before you upload it, before you submit your assignments, please check the answers because I'm not gonna check them. I'm just gonna grade you on the basis of, did you turn it in or not and is it complete? So it's your responsibility, all right? Um, I also have a uh, study guide for the exam. So just like before uh, in our module section here, if you scroll down to experiment three materials coming soon, you should be able to get this study guide. Don't forget the study guide is a guide. It's not a template. In other words, what's in there is not, these are the questions I'm gonna ask on the test. Uh, one thing that should be noted, please, and you can either view the guide here or you can download it, is that this exam includes some of the stuff we've learned in lab, mainly safety and techniques. To that effect, since some of these things were done before we went remote, I'd like to have an optional session, extra session tomorrow. Call it like an office hour, so Thursday at 1 p.m. I'm gonna have a quick review of lab safety and techniques. It'll be like a half hour thing. Yes, I'll record it for those of you can, who cannot make it. All right, uh, last but not least, uh, please be aware that uh, as I promised, I am gonna post a survey for you guys to do, and you can get five points extra credit for that. Unfortunately, I, I need to kind of like check it a couple more times, make sure that it is what it is. It's kind of like, I want it to be meaningful, but I don't want it to be too crowded, to have too many things that is hard later on to follow up with. 
but um, I've already conveyed to the company some feedback I got from you guys uh, in terms of the instructions for one of the parts that were not clear and also a typo that they had in one of the questions. So I've already conveyed that. So, you know, they're, they're very nice. And of course, remember, they're doing this for free. It's kind of like a little offering. They gave us a gift. So I don't want to be, uh, you know, a little grouchy on them. But uh, if this works, I would love to use this platform in the future. They have other activities in there that we could use. So I really value your feedback, all right? So please be on the lookout for that. When it's ready, I'll send an announcement to let you know that it's ready, all right? Okay, let's uh, check on our schedule here because it's important that we kind of like get a feeling of what's going on. And as I was saying, you are going to have this week, let's see, oops, this is not this week, we're already past that, I'm sorry. I thought it was gonna open to our page. Okay, here we go. Okay, so today we are trying to wrap up the uh, study of chemical bonding theories. We have an SI session at three o'clock with uh, Alexa. And like I said, tomorrow at one o'clock, if you are interested, we are gonna have an extra, uh, review here of lab techniques. Be aware there's several things coming up this weekend. There's a quiz on the topics we discussed uh, pretty much on Monday. There's also this worksheet that I gave you plus the one that's gonna be added. And then your Lewis structures homework from chapter 10 of TRO. I guess that would be uh, the fifth edition, I guess. Um, don't forget that I've posted in Canvas the uh, link for the answers to all the end of the chapter problems, the solutions to all the end of the chapter problems. Okay, so let's go ahead and get ready. If you can uh, look up your uh, notes, we're gonna go to our PowerPoint here and we're gonna pick up where we left off. Lewis theory essentially shows chemical bonds as, you know, single, double, or triple lines. And although we are aware that those do not accurately represent the distance between the atoms in those bonding schemes, it makes it look like, you know, a single bond is a single bond is a single bond. In other words, a single bond between two atoms is pretty much the same regardless of what the atoms are, other than being shorter or longer. The Lewis theory does not account for differences. For example, let's consider hydrogen and fluorine molecules, diatomic gases. I'm gonna build a little table here. And we're gonna propose, like Lewis said, that the bond consists of the sharing of two electrons between the two atoms, correct? So if we build a little table here, we can compare hydrogen and fluorine and we immediately see a couple of things. We see that, first of all, the bond dissociation energy or the bonding enthalpy is not the same. In other words, these two chemical bonds do not have the same energy. Secondly, but this we had seen already, although they're both single bonds between the two atoms in each molecule, the length of the bonds is different which makes sense because of course, we know that hydrogen and fluorine are different size atoms. So when they link together, it makes sense that they'll be a little farther apart. Today, we're gonna to discuss a theory which is called valence bond theory or VB. The theory proposes that bonds are formed by the sharing of electrons from overlapping atomic orbitals. So the idea is, that the atoms involved in a chemical bond are gonna put forth uh, some orbital or a few orbitals containing electrons. And those orbitals are going to overlap the atomic orbitals of the other atom. Kind of like clouds of electron density, sort of like merging uh, into each other. <clears throat> in this case, what we would propose is that for hydrogen, whose electron is in a 1s orbital, the overlap would be between two 1s orbitals. In fluorine, where there's a lone electron in a 2p orbital on each atom, those 2p orbitals would overlap 
to form the valence covalent bond. And that is the principle of this theory. Now, looking at how a chemical bond forms, and we discuss a little bit of this in that lecture that we kind of skipped over, but you can watch the uh, uh, recorded version of it. Let's say that we're trying to consider, let me get these controls out of the way. Let's say that we're trying to consider two atoms of hydrogen as they approach each other. So in other words, we're gonna start here on the right side and we're gonna consider, uh, although the scale shows distance going to the right, we're gonna consider what happens as the atoms approach each other. When they are far apart, there is very little chance for one set of electrons to interact with the positive charge of the other atom's nucleus. And so since there is really no interaction, we call that zero energy. There is no, uh, really no relation between the atoms and therefore no opportunity for interaction. As the atoms approach each other, in other words, as this distance decreases, you can see that the electron clouds begin to overlap each other and a region of greater electron density starts kind of like showing up right between the two of them. Notice that that region of uh, extreme electron density has a maximum where the energy has the minimum. We would say that the reason the energy is decreasing is because as the atoms approach each other, the electrons of one atom have a better opportunity of interacting with the positive charges on the neighboring atom's nucleus. And since that represents a position that favors uh, an attraction, we say that the energy is, is lower, right? Of course, if you continue getting the atoms closer to each other, you can see where the energy starts increasing again. That is because now you begin to have nucleus, nucleus repulsion. And nuclear, nuclear repulsion creates a spike in energy again, because you are trying to move the atoms essentially against what is naturally a repulsive force. So you can see where there is a minimum of energy at a distance, and that distance is gonna be what we call the bond length. If we were to draw electron uh, density maps, you can see that as the two hydrogen atoms approach each other, there is that region of greater electron density that starts building up right between them. And it has a maximum on the bottom picture there where those electrons are held in a region right between the two nuclei where those interactions can be maximized. Now, the thing is that not all molecules are formed essentially between just two atoms, much less two equal atoms, right? So what would happen if we tried to see the molecule of ammonia? So ammonia is NH3. Let's look at the configuration of nitrogen and do a little orbital diagram here. Of course, we have 1s2, 2s2, 2p3. And as we saw in our study of building up electron configurations, those three electrons in the 2p subshell would be localized, will be distributed, let's say, mainly in three different p orbitals. Now I'm gonna bring three atoms of hydrogen, each one of those having a single electron in a 1s orbital. So the idea is that if the 1s orbital of each hydrogen can overlap with one of the p orbitals of nitrogen, you would be able therefore to increase the stability by putting an electron in each one of these where you can have more stability by pairing the spins. So the next one would be here and the last one would be there. So this is what valence bond theory initially would predict. Now here's, here's the thing though, let's think geometrically now. Remember that the bonds 
if they form by overlapping p orbitals with the 1s, what would be the molecular geometry? Well, remember, p orbitals are aligned along the x, y, and z axis of three-dimensional space. So if I am going to uh, essentially join this in, right? Guys, I need you guys to come in uh, on time because every time somebody comes in, I get an interruption here on the PowerPoint slides. Uh, so I'm going to really encourage you guys in the future, please be punctual, okay? So we can start and we don't get interrupted. Uh, I cannot keep the system from popping these messages and blocking out the slides. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put, let's say, one hydrogen atom is going to go here, let's say. I'm trying to get this guy to draw here. It won't draw. Anyway, sorry about that. I can't get this thing to work right now. Here, let's try it again. All right. Highlighter. I got a lot. hydrogen there, hydrogen here, hydrogen here. Essentially, that would be three atoms forming bonds that are at 90 degrees of each other because these orbitals are at 90 degrees from each other. Well, the actual bond angle, as we saw last time, is 107.3 because the, the ammonia molecule is not uh, 90 degrees. It's actually a built on a tetrahedral arrangement of electron groups, and it gives a trigonal pyramid shape. So how does valence bond theory account for this? Well, here's the proposal. The proposal is that when an atom forms chemical bonds, sometimes what it will do is it'll mix two or more of the atomic orbitals to form a new set of hybrid orbitals. This is called hybridization. So what it does is it'll mix at least two non-equivalent atomic orbitals. Let's say, for example, 1s and 1p orbital. These hybrid orbitals that are formed, and essentially when we say mix, what that means is essentially recalculating the wave functions to yield new orbitals, not the original S and Ps, but hybrid orbitals with different shapes from the original atomic orbitals. One important thing is that the number of hybrid orbitals you generate has to be equal to the number of atomic orbitals that were used in the process. So now, when an atom is going to form a chemical bond, it has some other options. It can overlap hybrid orbitals on one atom with atomic orbitals on another atom, or you can overlap hybrid orbitals with hybrid orbitals on the other atom. So now you have a few more options to work with here. Okay, now what we're going to do now is we're going to watch a video. We're going to hope that I can make it work here. All right. And it's over here. And before we start, I want to make sure I get the screens out of the way. And hopefully, we'll get a good video this time. If not, we'll just re record it or post it. Here we go. Chemists use valence bond theory, and especially the concept of orbital hybridization, to answer a fundamental question. How do the shapes of the molecules we observe arise from the orbitals of the isolated ground state atoms that bond? The hybridization concept proposes that in the molecule, the orbitals of the central atom have mixed mathematically and become hybrid atomic orbitals. New wave functions with different electron densities and spatial orientations. Let's begin with the simplest case and see how the theory accounts for a molecule with a linear shape. A key point to note is that the number of atomic orbitals that mix always equals the number of hybrid orbitals that form. Here, two different atomic orbitals, 1, 2s, and 1, 2p, mix mathematically to become two identical sp hybrid orbitals, each with one larger and one smaller lobe. The two orbitals face in opposite directions in the atom. For clarity, we'll show hybrid orbitals in this simplified form. 
First, we'll use box diagrams to depict hybridization and consider the central beryllium atom in the linear molecule BeCl2. The isolated Be atom has filled 2s orbital and 3 empty 2p orbitals. In the process of hybridization, the 2s and one of the 2p's mix and form 2sp hybrid orbitals. The two electrons from the 2s become distributed into the sp orbitals, one electron each with parallel spin. The two other 2p orbitals remain empty and unhybridized. Here is the same process in a box diagram that shows orbital shapes. Putting these ideas together, we can imagine the hybridization process for BeCl2 is something like this. The isolated beryllium atom, with its filled 2s and empty 2p's, is shown with the small box diagram above. The chlorines have three 3p orbitals, but will fade out the ones that are not involved in bonding. In the molecule, beryllium has undergone sp hybridization. The half-filled sp hybrid orbitals overlap the half-filled chlorine orbitals to form two BeCl covalent bonds that are 180 degrees apart. From here on, we'll show electrons within orbitals as dots. To account for molecules with a trigonal planar shape, such as boron trifluoride, the model proposes that the ground state boron atom undergoes sp2 hybridization. The filled 2s of the central boron mixes with one half-filled and one empty 2p to become three half-filled sp2 hybrid orbitals. Boron's third 2p remains empty and unhybridized. Here's an orbital depiction of the ground state boron with filled 2s, half-filled 2p, and two empty 2p's. The fluorines have half-filled 2p orbitals. In BF3, the boron atom is hybridized, with the three sp2 hybrids pointing to the corners of an equilateral triangle. Boron and fluorine orbitals overlap to form three BF bonds 120 degrees apart. To account for the millions of molecules with tetrahedral shapes, the model proposes that the central atom undergoes sp3 hybridization. For example, in the carbon of methane, the filled 2s, two half-filled 2p's, and empty 2p mix and become four half-filled sp3 hybrid orbitals. The model describes bonding in methane this way. In the molecule, the carbon's four sp3 hybrid orbitals point to the corners of a tetrahedron. The H orbitals overlap them to form four CH bonds that are 109.5 degrees apart. For other shapes within a given electron group arrangement, the model proposes lone pairs in one or more of the hybrid orbitals. For example, the trigonal pyramidal shape of ammonia arises when the 2s and the three 2p's of the central nitrogen mix and become four sp3 hybrid orbitals, one which is filled with a lone pair. Here, we visualize the nitrogen atom undergoing sp3 hybridization. One of the tetrahedrally oriented sp3 hybrids is filled with a lone pair and the H atoms overlap the other three to form three NH bonds. In the case of water, with its V shape, the model proposes a situation similar to that for ammonia. The 2s orbital of the central O atom mixes with its three 2p's and becomes four sp3 hybrids, but now two of the hybrid orbitals are filled with lone pairs. In the water molecule, the oxygen has undergone sp3 hybridization. Two of the sp3 orbitals are filled with lone pairs, and the H atoms overlap the other two to form two OH bonds. Carbon is most commonly at the center of a tetrahedral grouping of single bonded atoms. But it also occurs at the center of a trigonal planar grouping that includes a double bond. 
Consider the carbon-carbon double bond in ethylene. Valence bond theory proposes that each carbon undergoes sp2 hybridization. Its filled 2s and two half-filled 2ps mix to become three half-filled sp2 hybrids, and the fourth electron occupies the unhybridized 2p. Let's examine the orbital view and highlight the two ways carbon orbitals overlap to create a double bond. Here, each carbon is undergoing sp2 hybridization. Note how the unhybridized 2p orbitals lie perpendicular to the trigonal plane of sp2 hybrids. The two sp2 orbitals facing each other overlap end to end. The bond they form is called a sigma bond. It is symmetrical along an imaginary line between the nuclei and is not weakened by the rotation of one atom with respect to the other. Now, focus on the two parallel 2p orbitals. By substituting accurate representations of 2p orbitals, you see that they can easily overlap side to side. This results in a pi bond, one that is not symmetrical along the line between the nuclei. Most importantly, it is weakened and in fact breaks by rotation of one atom with respect to the other. Thus, a double bond consists of one sigma and one pi bond. In the ethylene molecule, four H atoms overlap the four other carbon sp2 orbitals. Recall that in molecules with more than four atoms around the central atom, such as phosphorus pentachloride, the central atom utilizes d orbitals to expand its valence level. Hybridization accounts for the shapes of these molecules as well. In the ground state, phosphorus has a filled 3s orbital, three half-filled 3ps, and five empty 3ds. In PCL5, the 3s all the 3p's and one of the 5 3d orbitals mix to form five half-filled sp3d hybrid orbitals. The other four 3d orbitals remain empty and unhybridized. Here is the ground state phosphorus atom with the four 3d orbitals that remain unhybridized omitted for easier viewing. We'll move back to see the hybridized p atom in PCL5. The five sp3d hybrid orbitals point toward the corners of a trigonal bipyramid and half-filled 3p orbitals from five chlorines overlap them. Sulfur also has an expanded valence level in many of its compounds. In the ground state, it has a filled 3s orbital, one filled and two half-filled 3ps, and five empty 3ds. In the octahedral molecule sulfur hexafluoride, the 3s, all of the 3p, and two of the five 3d orbitals of the central s mix to form six half-filled sp3d2 hybrid orbitals. The three unhybridized 3d orbitals remain empty. Here you see the isolated sulfur with 3s, 3p, and the two 3d orbitals that will become hybridized. In SF6, the six sp3d2 hybrid orbitals point to the corners of an octahedron, and half-filled 2p orbitals of six fluorines have Oh, I was enjoying that so much. I guess we got cut off a little bit. The uh, video is excellent in displaying how you arrive at these different shapes of these hybrid orbitals and how they account perfectly for the shapes that we predicted in Vesper theory. Uh, I don't want you to feel that you have to know all the little details of that process. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to our PowerPoint here and we're gonna go back and discuss what are the really important things here, all right? So I don't want you guys thinking you had to memorize all that stuff that you saw there. Okay. Let's look at the formation, for example, of these so-called sp3 hybrid orbitals. Remember, the hybrid orbitals are going to have different shapes and different orientations than the original atomic orbitals. 
in this case, one S orbital and three P orbitals are going to be mixed or hybridized. And you can see in the middle of the picture there, the four lobed shapes of these hybrid orbitals, which point to the corners of an uh, a tetrahedron. And you can see that it even predicts the actual angle, 109.5 degrees between those orbitals. Again, we're showing you pictures. This is done through mathematical recalculations of the wave functions for these electrons. And the origin of saying sp3 is because if you add the quote unquote superscripts, there'll be one for s, three for p. That means that you combine one s orbital and three p orbitals. And that should give you a total of four of these hybrid orbitals. So when we look at methane on the left or ammonia on the right, what we see is that this sp3 hybridization predicts the tetrahedral geometry. And in this case, the central atom, whether it's carbon or nitrogen, is using purely hybrid orbitals for all the bonds. And in the case of nitrogen, for the lone pair that it has, uh, that is shown here on the top of the picture here on the right. Once more, notice that in the overlap of these orbitals with the S orbitals of hydrogen, you can see the double arrows they're representing two electrons that are being held in common, but because they are in a common area or region of space, their spins have to be paired. In other words, they have to have opposite spins. So do I have to know everything that that video showed? No, you don't need to know uh, how and what way do the orbitals combine. All you need to know is the following. Right now, we know how to draw the Lewis structure of a molecule, correct? We've learned that already and we're practicing it. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna count the number of lone pairs and the number of bonds or atoms bonded to the central atom. We call this the steric number. And essentially, whatever the steric number is, that is how many hybrid orbitals there have to be. So for example, if I have a total of two steric number, what that means is I need to combine two orbitals. Well, I have only one S. That means that the other one has to be a P orbital. And because there's two of them, that means you're going to have these guys in a linear arrangement, 180 degrees apart from each other. Let's say the steric number is three, which could be three single bonds, two single bonds and a double bond, two single bonds and a lone pair, or a double bond, a single bond and a lone pair, something like that, right? Remember, it doesn't matter uh, whether the bonds are single or double or triple, you count each bonded group as one electron group. So that means that we need to accommodate this structure, we need three hybrid orbitals. So that means we have to combine three. So that'd be one S and two P orbitals, so that gives you SP2, and you're gonna end up with the famous trigonal planar arrangement. Remember, the uh, valence bond theory is not concerned with the actual geometry of the molecules, only of the electron group arrangements. If you have four steric number, which again could be four single bonds, or it could be three single bonds and a lone pair, right, like ammonia, that means you need four hybrid orbitals. So you're gonna combine the S orbital with three of the P orbitals, so actually all three of them, to generate sp3. Again, if you add the superscripts, one plus three is four. That's how many hybrid orbitals you're getting. And these are gonna to point to the corners of a tetrahedral group arrangement. For atoms in the third period and below that can expand beyond the octet, you can have five electron groups around that central atom. So now what you're gonna do is you're gonna recruit besides the S, orbital and all three of the p orbitals you're going to recruit an extra d orbital and again that adds up to five like one plus three plus one and so this is going to give you the uh, trigonal bipyramidal shape for six electron groups you will have to recruit then one s orbital three p orbitals and two d orbitals so we call that type of hybrid orbital sp3d2 and essentially we call the uh, hybrid orbitals 
by just the acronym of all these orbitals that are getting combined or mixed or hybridized to form it. Six uh, electron groups is going to give you an octahedral shape, which is exactly what we predicted previously from our Vesper theory. Okay, so uh, let me, uh, before we move on, let me see if we're gonna move back here to our screen. I wanna see if there's any questions, if there are any questions, either posted on the chat room or if you have any questions you wanna ask, you can do the hand raising uh, icon here and let me know. Okay, so what we're gonna do is let's take a 10 minute break. Right now it's about 1.45, so we'll reconvene in 10 minutes. And we're gonna talk some more about some special situations that are caused when you have you know, double and triple versus single bonds, all right? So we'll come back in a few minutes. So 10 minutes, please, thank you. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a nice little break there. We're gonna continue. Uh, today's session will be a little shorter. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and put the uh, remainder of the chapter topics on a separate lecture. The reason is it really requires a focused attention and I don't think that we're gonna, I don't wanna be rushed in trying to do it today. So we're gonna look at a little more about bonding here. So let's go back to our PowerPoint. Where are we? Oh, here we are. Okay. So let's consider, for example, a carbon atom, which as we've talked about, is a very versatile element in terms of bonding. On the top, we see the ground state of carbon, 2s2, 2p2, that's the valence shell essentially, with the two electrons in the 2p subshell sitting in separate orbitals. One way of looking at the way that these hybrid orbitals are formed is by pretending that I'm going to take one of the 2s electrons and promote it, meaning put it in a higher subshell in terms of energy, which should be 2p. And now that I have those four electrons, I'm going to hybridize a selection of those orbitals. I'm sorry, not, or, not hybrid yet, half filled orbitals. I'm gonna make a selection to make the hybrid orbitals. I apologize for that. So I'm gonna choose for this particular case, three of those orbitals to make three sp2 hybrid orbitals. But that leaves one electron by itself in an unhybridized 2p. We're gonna choose the z orientation, which in three dimensional space represents, I don't know what we would, think of as the vertical dimension. And let's see what happens when a atom of carbon does this. So here are the electron clouds of these hybrid orbitals. They're the ones that are 120 degrees around, forming like a triangle. And uh, in this picture, they're sort of shaded in a kind of like a green color, but I don't know if that translates well into your screens. And then the single electron in the 2pz, as you can see, is uh, above or below. Remember that these things are waves and they have areas, regions of higher density with a node in between. So this uh, unhybridized 2pz orbital is perpendicular to the plane of the triangle formed by the three hybrid orbitals. So let's see what happens when carbon uses this bonding scheme to make uh, covalent bonds. So let's say that I have not one of these atoms, but two of them coming together. The structure of the compound ethylene, C2H4. As you saw in the video, when these come together, each carbon is hybridized to generate three of those sp2 orbitals. One of those orbitals on each atom is overlapping a corresponding sp2 orbital on the other atom 
to form the initial bond here. And uh, we should be able to see it here, right there. Oops. Okay. For some reason, my PowerPoint tools are refusing to work there. That's what I'm talking about, the sp2 orbitals overlapping each other. And notice that the other sp2 hybrid orbitals are the ones that are being used to make the bonds with the hydrogens. So far, you have a tri trigonal planar geometry on the left, trigonal planar on the right. So essentially, this is all happening on the same plane, in this case, from this perspective, as uh, the screen or the paper where you'd be looking at this. Now let's say that I do a rotation slightly around that carbon-carbon axis so that I can see what is above and below that plane. And we see there these 2PZ orbitals, which actually those clouds, if we depict them accurately, they're not that low. They're actually kind of like reaching out towards each other. And that allows those two electrons to be shared by a single cloud here, and we call that a pi bond. In a pi bond, the electrons that are shared are shared in an electron density cloud above and below the line that connects the two atoms. Notice that if we go through here, the bonds that are right on that line between the atoms, we call them sigma bonds. The electron density is right between the two atoms. This is essentially the initial proposal we made for covalent bonding. Now we're having to amplify to indicate that sometimes you have what are called pi bonds. These are where the electron density above and below the plane of the nuclei of the bonding atoms. So in essence, what we're saying is that when you have a double bond, you have a sigma bond, a pair of electrons held right between the atoms and a pi bond, in other words, a pair of electrons being held in the regions above and below that axis between the two atoms. Let's look at another possibility. Once more, I take the ground state of carbon there on the top. I promote an electron to generate four half-filled orbitals, atomic orbitals. And now this time, I'm gonna select to only take two of them to make hybrids, which are gonna be the sp orbitals. And that means that there's gonna be therefore two unhybridized orbitals, pz and py. In other words, these are going to be perpendicular to each other. Let's look at this other compound called acetylene, C2H2. In this case, you can see on the left how each carbon has an sp hybrid orbital, one pointing towards each other and one pointing towards the hydrogen. But remember that in the structure, if we include those unhybridized p orbitals, you have a pair of z orbitals and a pair of y orbitals at 90 degree angles from each other. And since each one of those contains an electron, two electrons can therefore pair up, but they're gonna end up pairing up uh, above and to the side of the axis between the atoms. It makes it look like, like a collection of a sausage with two sets of buns in there. Notice that the density cloud is right between the atoms, but also all the way around, indicating a farther kind of dispersion of that electron density. So let's look at a compound that we studied before. This is formaldehyde. We did the Lewis structure of formaldehyde by re rejecting another competing structure that generated formal charges. And this is the one that we landed at. Now we're going to try to explain what is the bonding like in here. Again, consider the steric number of the carbon. We have one, two, three electron groups around the carbon. Remember the double bond doesn't count as two, it counts as one bonded atom. Since we have three electron groups, that means that we should have a trigonal planar geometry. And because there are three electron groups, we need three hybrid orbitals. So that means that these are gonna be sp2. 
Remember that we said that when you form an sp2 orbital with carbon, you have to leave an electron in a 2pz unhybridized orbital. So here's this monstrosity of a picture here. Now, you might remember about oxygen, right? Remember that the valence structure of oxygen had us at 2s2. To P4, which means that oxygen had in its three P orbitals, it had one that was full and then two that were incomplete. So that means that oxygen has these two lone pairs. So what it's going to do is, you know, one of those can be used to make the sigma bond with carbon. And the other one can be used since it's going to be, per let's say, for example, that it's using the, uh, let's say this is the X, this is, let's say this is the X axis of the oxygen, and that's the 2PX orbital. And so that electron is going to form a sigma bond with the one of the sp2 hybrid orbitals of carbon. The other electron, right? the one that would be in the other, let's say this is the 2pz orbital, that's the one that is above, that one can overlap above the axis between the carbon and oxygen with the unhybridized electron in a p orbital in carbon to form a pi bond. Notice that carbon still has two other sp2 hybrid orbitals that are going to form sigma bonds with the hydrogens. So the key thing here is that in the Lewis structure, we see that double bond between carbon and oxygen. Valence bond theory is proposing that that double bond actually consists of a sigma bond, which is an overlap of orbitals right between the two atoms, and one pi bond, which is the overlap of electrons in orbitals above and below the plane that is formed by that triangular shape. Cool, huh? I know it's a little challenging because some of us are not as good at translating pictures on a page with three-dimensional shapes. And uh, I apologize that this looks a little disjointed here. Let me see if I can fix it a little bit here so it'll look a little better. So let me complete this S over there. And this was 2P. And this was a two here. All right. Uh, I just should probably just erase all that. There we go. That's probably a little better. All right. So what we saw was that this would have been the two Man. P. Wow, that's that's even worse than before. I apologize for that. My stylus is not very good. I got to get me a good stylus. Maybe in the break between spring and summer, I'll do that once I get my stimulus check. Okay, but you get the idea, right? So uh, essentially what we're saying is that in the formation of compounds that have multiple bonds, we see that a single bond would represent electrons shared right between the two atoms, and that would be one sigma bond. A double bond would require us to have electrons that are shared above and below the axis between the atoms, which means you now have one sigma bond and one pi bond. And a triple bond would require us to have one sigma bond and two pi bonds. So I'm gonna put a structure here for you guys. This is the molecule acetic acid, which is the uh, thing responsible for the acidity of vinegar. And here is the Lewis structure of acetic acid. I'd like for you to come out and tell us, well, I'll, I'll let you work on it and then I'll post them. Let's do it that way. How many sigma and how many pi bonds are in total in the whole molecule of acetic acid? I'm gonna give you a few seconds to work on it. And then I'll post the answer here.
Okay, so let's see. First of all, let's consider all of those single bonds that we have in here. So that's six of them, and each single bond is a sigma bond. But we also have a double bond here between this carbon and that oxygen. And each double bond also has one sigma bond as part of it. So that means that we're going to have a total of seven sigma bonds. Okay, everybody got that right, correct? Okay, let's look at pi bonds. Well, you're only going to have pi bonds where there are double or triple bonds. And in this case, as we saw, we had that double bond there. So that should include one pi bond. So the answer to the question, how many sigma and how many pi bonds are in acidic acid? There are seven sigma bonds and one pi bond. Remember guys, this is theory, okay? All of this is theory. Yes, it is somewhat proven by certain kinds of data that you obtain, uh, but remember that it is theory, okay? Uh, molecules don't form by atoms getting together. Hey dude, why don't you and I form a sigma and a pi bond? Let's go pi, man. No, it doesn't work that way, okay? Nature doesn't think that it's making these things. We have categorized these things because our brains request that we organize the information around us so we can see patterns and we can predict behaviors, right? That was one of the topics we discussed in our first lecture ever. One more thing that happens when you have double bonds is that you restrict the rotation. So here are two compounds, both of which are called, you know, well, actually, this is one, two dichloroethane, and the other one's called dichloroethene. So you can see where there's only one letter difference in there. The difference is that di one, two dichloroethane has a single bond. You can look at the Lewis structure there on the top left. Whereas one, two dichloroethene actually has uh, a double bond in there. And the point they're making here is that that is going to restrict the rotation around that single bond. What I'd like to do is I'd like for us to go to this video and I'm gonna see if I can find it here. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pick it up kind of like after it has started. Uh, all I'm gonna say is please stay awake. Uh, it's a little challenging sometimes to see these things at this time of the day, but uh, since this uh, lecture is going to be recorded, you'll get to see it later if you want. Okay, here we go. Before we start talking about alkenes and their GMH isomers, um, I think a good starting point is a simple alkane. This is 1,2-dichloroethane. It's got single bonds between the two carbon atoms. And um, if this was a structure of a molecule, I could draw a picture of it, and um, it would look, in terms of fully expanded, like a top diagram above. I've got two chlorines up top, two hydrogens down the bottom, and there's a hydrogen left and a hydrogen right that are, that are slightly obscured because of the geometry. Uh, the top diagram is a expanded structural formula it shows exactly all the bonds in the structure, whereas the bottom one is a condensed structural formula. It sh still shows us the sequence of all the atoms in the molecule, but it's much, much faster to write. But the thing about this model is, is that this molecule could be viewed from many different angles. And if I were to view it from, let's say, this angle, I would actually draw the two chlorines being left and right, and the hydrogens up and down and up and down on each side. It's still the same molecule, just viewed from a slightly different angle. And um, to show that on paper, I could have drawn those two chlorines in two different arrangements. It could also sit possibly with the two chlorines both looking downwards, in which case I would draw a structural formula like that. Every single one of these are all equivalent because it's still the same thing just viewed from different angles. But there's one more trick that this molecule can do, and that is, is that whenever there's a single bond present, the atoms on each end of it can rotate about the axis of that bond. That means 
that this one here can spin on this axis of the double bond and this one here can also do the same. Okay, so both of these atoms have this free movement available. They can spin around as they wish. And that means that I don't necessarily have to have the two chlorines sticking up side by side. They could be in any other possible position relative to each other. So it means that this molecule could also be drawn like this, in which case there is a chlorine above and below on each side, and the hydrogens are taking up the other remaining spots. It's still the exact same molecule because all I've done to change it from what it was originally to what it is now is just rotated the molecule internally within its own structure. The same thing would apply for any simple single bonded carbon chain. This is four carbons all in a line, but um, I don't necessarily have to draw them like that because with all of these bonds having free rotation, I could draw three in a row and one down, or I could draw one up and one down, or I could draw the whole thing as some sort of N shape or as some sort of U shape. Um, exactly which one I draw is really um, irrelevant because it's all the same molecule, just twisted internally. Of course, for, for clarity, a uh, structural formula will generally have all atoms drawn in a row, or if you draw um, the skeletal formulas, generally it will be drawn as a bit of a zigzag. Alkenes are different because they have a double bond between the carbon atoms and that limits what kind of rotation is available for those atoms. But, but first of all, if we looked at this one here, it's 1,2-dichlorobutene. And um, I could hold this in a couple of different positions to give different perspectives. So this one here <laughs> probably matches this. Yes, it does. So on the left, we've got the chlorine up top, and on the right, we've got the chlorine down the bottom. Okay, But the exact same molecule flipped over we could now draw it as having a chlorine on one side down on the left and on the right hand side it's now up. It's still the exact same molecule just one perspective versus another one. However what this molecule can't do is rotate on the axis of this double bond. That means the two carbons on the end of that double bond cannot twist spin independently of the other one. The double bond does not allow it. There is no ability to twist around. That means that I can't get this structure twisted around and get both my chlorine atoms facing either both up or both down. So at no stage can I turn this structure into this one. They both still have the same structural formula because in terms of the sequence of atoms in the molecule, it has got a hydrogen and a chlorine on the left and a hydrogen and a chlorine on the right. There's a double bond between them, so in terms of the sequence of atoms and bonds, it's identical. However, the arrangement of space of these atoms is different. Okay, wake up. <laughs> We're back. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty much enough. Uh, you get the idea, right? Uh, when you have a single bond between atoms, you are able to rotate freely, and you can generate a lot of what seem to be like different uh, shapes, different organizations, but they're not, they're all the same. All the atoms are connected the same way. But when you have a double bond, things change. Uh, let me show you, um, back to our PowerPoint show here. Uh, the thing is that this is kind of a little complicated, but you can look at it later on. Uh, I think this picture is in your TRO book. And let's see if we can get that out of the way here. Uh, what I do want to show you is the next uh, slide here, because that one shows you exactly the what we were talking about. If instead of the Lewis structure in the top, we did the space filling models that you have in the bottom, 
you can see how the presence of the double bond does not allow rotation around that carbon-carbon axis. And therefore, the structure on the left and the structure on the right cannot be converted into each other, neither by kind of putting the molecule, looking at it from a different perspective, or trying to uh, rotate around that carbon-carbon bond because you can't anymore. And therefore, these two compounds have the same formula, they have the same atom to atom connections, but they have different orientations in space. We call these geometric isomers. Isomer means compounds that have the same formula but different structure. In this case, the difference in structure is geometric. It has to do with how they're oriented in space. And the traditional nomenclature of these kind of things is to call the compound where, uh, if you go from left to right through the double bond, coming in from the left, you're entering from the bottom, going across the double bond, you're exiting from the bottom also on the same side, in other words, of the double bond. We call that the cis isomer. And the one on the right, where you enter the double bond, left to right, and then you exit on the opposite side, we call that the trans uh, isomer. You'll get to learn more about these kind of things in your organic chemistry later on. And you will see that these compounds, that small difference makes a huge difference in many of their properties. Like for example, their polarity, their boiling points, uh, their ability to mix with other compounds, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> okay, let me uh, finish up by pointing out that, again, we are talking about something that is a theory. It is a model. And of course, it's gonna have some limitations. The first one is, we already talked about this, just like Lewis theory, Venice bond theory cannot explain molecules like nitrogen monoxide because it cannot explain how you would have a stable molecule when you have electrons that are not paired. Valence bond theory as well as Lewis theory kind of require that electrons be paired up. The other thing is perhaps a little more interesting and it is that valence bond theory does not address the magnetic properties of substances. Let's consider the oxygen molecule. The oxygen molecule, if you count the number of electrons, you can see that it's an even number. In other words, there are no unpaired electrons. Every single electron is paired. And by pairing, we mean that for every electron of a spin up, there's a corresponding electron of a spin down. That's what it means to be paired up. It means that you have all of the spins are canceled out. That means that this molecule should have no net magnetic field generated. It should be diamagnetic. Now here's what's interesting. If you run liquefied oxygen through a magnet, look what happens in the middle there. It sticks. In other words, oxygen molecules do have a magnetic field, they are paramagnetic. But according to the Lewis structure and according to Venice bond theory, all of the electrons should be paired up and therefore there should be no net magnetic field. So this is where uh, the valence bond theory falls short. Uh, you can actually test for this by running this experiment. I think I mentioned this earlier. This is just a sketch, okay? The machine doesn't look like this, but it's kind of a sketch. You're basically gonna suspend a tube with your sample from a balance, and you're gonna bring it close to an electromagnet. If the substance is paramagnetic, in other words, if it has unpaired electron spins and therefore has a net magnetic field, it is gonna be drawn into the electromagnet. And based on the weight that is pulled on the balance, you can do classical physics calculations as to the strength of that magnetic field and even calculate pretty much how many unpaired electrons are in that structure. So this is the experiment that we do. So because valence bond theory is great at explaining the shapes of molecules and fits the Vesper theory, but it cannot explain the magnetic properties of substances, it is time for a new theory, and this is called the molecular orbital theory. However, we're gonna leave it here. I am going to cover that in a 
separate lecture that I'll record and you guys will get to watch. I'll put the announcement out there so you guys can get to see it, okay? So hopefully that'll be enough for you guys to, number one, take your other quiz this week and also do both of the worksheets that are gonna be on Canvas. One of them is already out there. It's just about Lewis structures. The second worksheet is about Lewis structures, but it also includes all of this stuff about geometric shapes and Vesper and uh, atomic orbital hybridization, all right? So we're gonna leave it here unless anybody has any questions. I'm gonna give you some chance here to kind of like process a little bit, or as a friend of mine from the South used to say, percolate this. <laughs> All right, guys, well, that's gonna be it. Uh, we will uh, reconvene uh, if you want. We have a special session tomorrow at one o'clock. I'm just gonna go over some of the lab stuff. So if you wanna join in, uh, you can do that. I will record the session so you don't have to be there, you know, physically if you don't, if you don't want to. But if you wanna ask questions, feel free to join and uh, come in with your questions, okay? This is gonna be essentially a review of lab safety and techniques stuff that you need for the exam. Don't forget, the study guide for the exam is available on Canvas. Don't forget, you have uh, a couple of worksheets, a quiz, and some homework to deal with this weekend, and plus studying for the test next week. Please don't wait till the last minute. It'll be very similar to the last one and also have the same type of security measures and all that stuff. But uh, hey, uh, I'm only a messenger, okay? Thank you so much for uh, joining us and have a great rest of the day. Great, great rest of the week. If I don't see you tomorrow, I will see you next week, all right? Thank you.